All right, welcome everybody to the spring AAP section on emergency medicine education session. We're going to lead off first with um, Javier Gonzalez Del Rey, who's going to talk about a bit of a historical perspective on ACGME program requirement changes, um, work hours, and a whole lot more. Then I'm going to briefly give you an overview of the proposed changes with the knowledge that um, the final version will be due out in September with a, a keen lean into the discussion around procedures. Um, then we are going to have uh, two guests present on you know, their experience with training and procedures. Uh, David Kessler, who will hopefully inspire you. Hopefully you catch what I said there, David, um, as well as Ellie Comser, who's a recent graduate who's going to talk about um, her experience in um, being ready for procedures as she headed out into practice. Um, but Javier, you are now on the stage. Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming in a, uh, at least in this area, beautiful afternoon. Um, I said before when I started that, first of all, those of you who are on camera, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And those of you, here you go, Nirit is driving, which is even great. Don't look at the camera. <laughs> uh, but those of you who are around, if you can unlock your camera, that will be great. Uh, as I was telling Brad, it's sometimes it's so, hi, Josh, sometimes it's so boring not to look at uh, people's faces. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those of you. Okay. So. There's no uh, uh, true uh, setup uh, uh, speech about the historical changes at ACGME, nor I am an expert at ACGME. So what I can give you is sort of like a little experience from program directorship, residency directorship, uh, um, fellowship director, program director, and DIO over the last close to 30 years and how things have changed. Um, believe it or not, the ACGME started in 1981. Okay, it's um, it, before it used to be called the liaison, not the ACGME. Okay, it was a liaison of common training in pediatrics or something like that. That was supposed to be the one sort of informally regulated. What happened since that since um, Medicare provided a lot of money to GME uh, mm -hmm. uh, at that time, still the C, the Children's Hospital funds were not there. Mm -hmm. um, they started to ask for what is the product and how we can regulate and standardize training. So the ACGME was created for that reason. So for those of you who are in the education world, you know that um, the GME is the part of the institution that sort of like works on graduate medical education to make sure that ensures that compliance for ACGME requirements, who, who is the one that at the national level regulates the requirements for each one of the programs, and then you have the, a, the a for us is the ABP, American Board of Pediatrics, who ensures that the training is completed and everybody meets the criteria to then provide the services. So in short, every time you get them in the meeting, the ABP says we represent the customers, the ACGME says we represent the programs, and the GME we represent the institution. I mean, if you go that route, that's how it works. Now, the ACGME has transitioned a lot. Because at the beginning, it was mostly um, uh, a, re a recollection of a data to see if you meet certain rules that they existed, right? Um, you know, when I was in pediatric training, it was six months, for example, of neonatology was required at that time. It's like, you know, six months to six diseases, I guess, one month per disease. But anyway, so the way it works was that they collected, have you done this rotation? Have you done these procedures? And it was data-driven visits that were every five years or so, okay? If you were in to improvement cycle, it was every third year. And if you have something to fix, every so one year. And it was panic mode every time you got one of those. I mean, some all program directors, I'm pretty sure that Tony and Jeff, I don't see anybody else from that generation in here, had that pifisitis because it was called the PIF. Uh, it was the program information forms that you have to complete. And it was like 400 forms at that time. So it was not bad. I mean, it just, it was a check-in every certain time, but the problem with that process at that time was that you can put all the things together and then for five years, what are you doing? How is it changing? Okay. So people were scratching their heads to say, is this the best way to go? So they, they, there was a transition at that time because the board, American Board of Pediatrics started looking into are the product that we're giving out there when they graduate competent enough? The competency did not exist at what I'm talking about. I'm just using the word, were they competent or not? So the, at the, in the country, there was this caution of, okay, so you do all this month, 
is the program that you're getting uh, based on months and check what it is and what is needed. Because of that, the ACGME is starting to look into their process and began, began collecting information to start shifting into the, non, the new accreditation system, okay? That is in the background. All the things happen in the middle. Now we're talking, if you move to the 1990s, right? It was the first revision of certain procedures because we were asked at that time, in pediatric at least, with residency, you know, chest tubes and everything else. Well, surfactant came in. Nobody was popping in chest tubes anymore like we were doing in our residency that every five minutes you have to go on, not five minutes, but you have to put a chest tube because of a pneumothorax when you were in the nursery. So intubation and other things were changing, you know, umbilical lines were changing. So people start questioning, do we need to recommend all these things? And actually, the pediatrician doesn't do that. Also, it was the first time that when they started to look at rotations, there was no, um, as long as you meet, there were 18 months that you have to meet, there was fixed rotations in there. The rest was pretty open. So that, you know, all, it's called elective in general. So there was no definition for what elective you can take. So people were doing surgical electives or doing surgical rotations, okay, that were required for the program or BMT starting to come up and people were doing those exposures. And it was a time that service was taking over a little bit more than actually education was needed. Um, not intentionally, but a lot of the large programs says, okay, I need to cover all these subspecialties. And because they're under the umbrella of elective, they were then mandated elective, which is one of the things that the ACGME is starting to react a little bit. What happens though, you now I have to navigate to 1993, 1996, uh, there was a discontent because there was a lot of issues. I mean, there were a couple of, there was a kid, the son of a senator, you remember that almost, you know, passed away when, when he was driving. There were a couple of errors that were happening. In the meantime, the Institute of Medicine brings the chiasm of care, you know, to air is human, right? And a citizen group went to the Institute, at, at that time, today's National Academy of Science, before it was the National Institute, uh, um, what was it before? Uh, well, having a brain fart, <laughs> but it was the national, um, uh, Jeff, it, now is National Academy of Science before it was, uh, how is it used to be called? It's the same thing. It's the uh, IOM, Institute of Medicine. Institute of Medicine. Citizens approached through the government and say that they needed a reform on the number of hours required because it was abusive, the program that we have, uh, and that it was exploitation of trainees and it was unsafe. Um, so a group was put together. I was lucky or not lucky, I was part of that group. And then we started to analyze over a year and a half, almost two years, all the data that was available um, uh, and in regards of sleep cycles and everything else and safety. Uh, before I go how the ACME reacted, let me tell you that if you read the report, because I have a conversation with someone that came uh, give run rounds in here, and they say there was no link between uh, the sleep and safety. Well, actually, uh, in part, yes, but that's not completely true because the report did not only have hours regulated. I mean, who is going to think that every other night was the same? I had every other night and you were like in drugs the next day. So, of course, the fatigue and everything else was causing issues. Now, the report, believe it or not, what happened, it has 18 regulations, increased supervision, you know, ancillary support, not wasting your time and doing things that are not learning for the specialty that you have. But, of course, everybody took the hours linked to safety and forgot that there is a big note at the end of the recommendation that says if you do this separately, you may not impact on anything. So, if you remember, you got it wrong to cover the hours. But a lot of programs, what they did is they compressed the work with the same number of people, and then the safety probably was not changed for that. Long story short, ACGME gets the pressure from that report, and the first big change that they do that had to respond out there was the, like you know, the hour regulations that came in 2008. Uh, there was a big stinge. Uh, at that time, if you remember, most of you, there was not enough nurse practitioners or their ancillary groups. There were no enough PAs and things like that. But it was it was a, a mandate that actually revolutionized coverage in the hospital and put a lot of pressure into the different areas. And for the first time, 
program directors have to make the decision to say, no, in order for me to maintain this, I need to go back to what is requiring pediatrics, not necessarily the service that I am providing. For example, I'm not afraid to say in our institution, we have to drop the surgical rotation. We eliminated the sleep medicine that we were covering at nine. Some of the BMT was eliminated, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of things starting to change. So SCGME makes that change in 2008-ish around there. In the meantime, the board also comes with another change and said, no, we're not competent enough. And because the IOM, the Institute of Medicine, has released the different domains of what quality of care is supposed to be, the famous six competencies that you hear, ACGME also introduced the competency process into that. Uh, but again, what happens with the hours is that there was a measurable outcome to say, if you do this, you're fine. If not, you're going to be on uh, probation or improvement or citations. With the competency, some of them were easy to do, but for example, professionalism, still people trying to define or how do we measure, how do we do these things. But the six competencies were instituted, and that was another big change that happened in there. Um, we have not even finished the competency evaluation, and then the EPAs get introduced, and you were all part of the EPAs. I'm just doing big lips, okay? And then now in pediatrics, there are new revisions that come. By the way, this is not the first one. This is probably the third one in the last seven years with the requirements coming in. So a lot of people say, so where do they come this from? Well, every certain time they look at the environment, they look at the people, they look at the trainees, they look at their data, and they come up with certain, I think sometimes they react, sometimes they do it very good. ACGME is not a bad part, it's not a bad group. It's just trying to do the best with what they have. They take input from everybody and they try to move in that direction. For example, right now, they're trying to say, we, do, we need to have so much subspecialty when in, in reality, we need to have more generalists in pediatrics out there. And then people can cater their training to subspecialty if they want. Uh, the problem is that the pendulum can go too far in one direction and too far in the other, right? Just asking a medical student that just graduated to say, what do you like to learn? And it's like, okay, I would like to do these things that I'm not on call. I'm not saying they're bad guys, but you can choose what is not necessarily what you need to learn. And you as a, as a attending can, or program director have a lot of input to say, we need this. So what you're hear later on from Brad is that there is a new revisions that came out. Um, it does affect a lot of different areas. Um, and uh, it's going to be a challenge because what it does is basically limits now the numbers of specialties that uh, you can use as before. So you will see programs saying, well, you know, nephrology, I'm sorry, I'm not going to no, um, be able to provide coverage. I have one, my, I have my concern. If they get approved the way it is right now, it may be a double-edged sword because, for example, we're finishing now in the National Academy of Science a, a report for the workforce for the future. And we find out that the evidence shows that the early exposure to different subspecialties influence students and residents in what direction they want to go. So if right now there's some areas that are not going to be exposed, how are we going to get people enticed to go in those directions in the future? The latest changes that came in the background that people may not even realize, which is a headache for the DIO now, right? So I talk about fellowship, program residency, how you change, but the designated institutional officers, the way she's there, uh, we have a big headache right now. Um, because before you have standard programs, you know, the typical cardiology, nephrology, endocrinology, developmental, those are standard programs. What had happened is that there is another agency, the ECFMG. ECFMG is the one that controls the visa and the processes for, you know, IMGs, international medical graduates come to the country. A lot of programs used to develop a one-year type of fellowship. You want to remove the fingernails on the right hand, there's a fellowship. You want to remove the fingernails on the left hand, there's another fellowship. And all these fellowships were not, you know, um, I don't want to say regulated, but there was no quality control of the product that is out there. So in a very um, blunt approach, last year, without even having a plane with winds yet, um, the ACGME, the ECFMG, decided that now they non-standard programs will become and will be oversee. Uh, I mean, we have to have the same standards as standard programs. So for DIOs now, the headache went from 49, 30 programs to 110, 112 programs, depending upon how many programs you have. So now you will see that all those extra years will have to follow certain rules. And as a matter of fact, their evaluation process starts much earlier than the regular years, because these are the 
these are the programs that can also be used for exceptional um, candidates that can come just to do this and leave the country back. Um, so as you can see, because I, I want to leave time for it, they, the changes are, I don't think they are they are all the time like we think like, oh, why are they doing this? I think they take information, they look at the milieu, they look at the environment that we are right now. If you look at the changes for each subspecialty, they are different because this subspecialty has what they have, what they call the RRCs, residency review committees. They look into the different things, get the input from program directors and the community, and then they move forward with certain changes. I think uh, from the prescriptive nature that it was at the beginning, is more of a program directors and institutional look. However, um, the program director sometimes, for example, if all these institution uh, or all these changes are approved, the program directors may be left a little bit at limbo because they're gonna be the ones that are having to come back to the institution to say, this is what we can do or not. And that they may have some frictions in there, right? It's like the ACGME hours in 2008. It was a mandate, you have to do it. And wow, you know, the program directors were the bad guys. The IOM was the bad guys. And it's not actually, it was a change that if you really look, make life a little easier. Not that people are not working. People are still working, uh, but they try to eliminate the maximum. The last thing that I want to say is ACGME, ACGME sets minimal bars. They say this is what is minimal requirements. You can excel on that. But when they say this is what your residents you know, should be exposed to, it's a minimal bar. The last thing is the survey. Surveys have been becoming a little bit on the flat side because it seems that throughout the nation over the last four or five years, the same areas have been coming with the lower uh, numbers. Uh, discrimination, workload, uh, congestion in the learning environment, and there is some discrepancy between faculty survey answers and residency surveys or fellow surveys answers. However, uh, the way they're reporting it is interesting because it's helping particularly fellowship how to analyze the data because you may say, well, I have one fellow that is answering everything wrong. Okay, so your numbers may be down, but if the percentage compliant in the report says that 90% of your residents are in compliant and only one resident is not in compliant, then you know that your reaction should be different that if 50% of your answers are in non-compliance. So that's where we are right now. So I am, you know, Brad, are um, happy to answer any questions, any issues, but that's a historical perspective how they ACG have changed over the years. And I wouldn't be surprised it will continue to change as we move forward. Thank you, Javier. Being I was in training in around the 2008, and I and I remember what a a big hullabaloo it was. And I mean, it ended up okay, hopefully. Um, does anybody have any other perspectives or thoughts um, or questions that they wanted to to share uh, with Javier? This is Ellie Concert. I was going to just say, I'm the one who just recently graduated from residency, but I know a lot of um, attendings during residency, even though, you know, it was in 2008 that change was made, would say they felt like residents weren't as well trained as um, they were prior to 2008 because of that change. Do you, did you all feel that same way as well? Or what were your thoughts on that? I can give you my perspective. Um, as a matter of fact, that's a different topic because that would be generational differences in how they influence medical education yeah and, and usually um us boomers and i can see some boomers in here you know tony jeff the west you're probably a little bit younger than that and Tavan also but uh, we tend to get a little fixated on what we do things and every time something changes we're very hard-headed to say no this is how i used to do it if you look at the index of complexity from when we were residents to currently it had probably multiplied by 10, number one. Uh, the amount of patients and volumes that we're seeing has increased tremendously. The knowledge that is in the medical school has increased to probably 70%. Now, what could be different is that because there was less knowledge during the medical school time when I was a medical student, I had to be explored more to patient care, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, so there's some skills that you develop uh, uh, more in regards of communication or failure rates, because remember, uh, also for the bad of the patient, 
for the good of me, uh, I didn't have to precept every single patient uh, until 1996 when the HIPAA rule came. So you made a lot of decisions. There was a lot of personal investment into what you were doing and a lot of scariness. As a matter of fact, in 1996, when it was said that, no, if you're going to charge anything, everybody needs to be presented. Most of us, our eyeballs went like, oh, my God, are they sending these kids home? <laughs> because it was like, um, you know, it's the Russian roulette when you come to it. So are they certain things that, that, are, that were a little bit more um, in the previous time? I think the art of medicine was a little bit better, a little bit, because of the non-virtuality based based um, patient relations and the failure rate that you have to do to learn as you go forward, right? We didn't have simulations, so unfortunately your simulations were real patients. Um, but from there to say that they're not prepared right now, uh, I think that's a generalization that we need to be careful how we do it. You have to ask in what area uh, they may or may not be prepared because I believe that our current residents they do circles compared to when I was a resident compared to you know, when we talk about certain diseases and certain stuff. So procedure wise, maybe we're better. Um, complexity of patient care, you definitely are better. Communications, we may be a little bit better, but that you'll catch up as you go forward with this. Um, knowledge base, wow, your knowledge base is tenfold higher than ours. We have to catch up with that knowledge base that you have. So I don't think it's Anybody who is into the pointing fingers that in my time and your time is out of whack. You cannot judge by the past what you're having in the present. It was a big debate that I watched the other day. My family's from Spain, of course, and there were people that were frontal about Christopher Columbus should not be even recognized because of colonization and everything else. I mean, I respect everybody's thought on that. Uh, but my question was, okay, so when are you going to get the C4? And the guy looks at me, this was, a, by the way, here in my neighborhood that we're having that conversation. I say, what do you mean C4? Yeah, because you need to turn the Coliseum down and the pyramids in Egypt because they were constructed with slave too. So what are, you know, when are we going to start destroying those? So at the moment that we start judging through the eyes of this generation what had happened in the past, by the same token that those in the past start judging with the eyes of the past, the new generation, we're not in communication anymore. We just not, not, not making an assessment that is not based on evidence. If you look at the evidence, we're putting the product that we need out there. We were hit by COVID and COVID has made a tremendous impact. And it's gonna take us about six, seven years to catch up. Because remember, those two years of medical students that are coming to the market are completely mindset different like the ones that before. So um, we, we just need to, move on the real life and, and accept what we have. I mean, when I'm with the residents, I was uh, Sunday night. I had to go to them and say, hey, explain to me these three medications because I had no clue what they, <laughs> what they were talking about. And then in five seconds, say, oh, this is, we use this for this, we use it for that. Oh, thank you very much. And I just went and left. You know what I mean? It's, 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 I don't think we should be, and all of us and all of you are interested in education, you should not be pointing fingers at who's better or not. What we need to do is where we are right now, and we can only criticize if the product that we're putting right now is not ready to face what we have right now. So are we ready to face um, social issues? Are we ready to face discrimination? Are we ready to face mental health issues? Are we ready to, you know, that's what we need to do. Are you going to work in a community ED pediatrics or are you going to work in an academic ED pediatrics? All those things is what needs to be taken into consideration. So, you know, I... I uh, I'm, I'm old, but I'm not gonna go there myself. <laughs> Wendy, you have your hand raised. So I think we all know different things is the problem. Uh, younger people know more of the what they learned in medical school, which we didn't have. Um, older people know more, I guess, by from experience and taking care of patients. So it's different, and the challenge is you have to meet people where they want to be. So if I want to be a general pediatrician, do I really need to do know how to do a hundred different procedures? Probably not. I probably need to know what I need to know to do in the um, in my office, but I don't necessarily, I probably need to know some life-saving things, but I don't necessarily need to know the 10 procedures the ACGME says. Now, there's that being said, people should at least have some exposure to know what's going on, but you have to dig deep where you need to dig deep. 
and you know a little bit of this but a whole lot of what you're going to do with your life um so we all and, do and, and, and the other thing when you follow your lines is we have to be careful not to capture ourselves as teachers that has one heel for everybody um you know for example you know let's say if i'm talking about abdominal pain with a yeah, with a with a resident in the emergency room, you know, I ask him where he's gonna do, and if he's gonna do the emergency medicine, I'm gonna take him to the whole shubanga. But if he's going, I don't know, into community practice, I say, okay, so these are the things that you can do in your office. So you can help us to avoid overcrowding. And you know, they understand that they can get an ultrasound as an outpatient, or they can get a CAT scan or MRI as an outpatient. They can get labs, and then they get referred rather than some of the pattern that in some communities you see that, oh, go to the emergency room, go to the emergency room, go to the emergency room. I mean, that's not gonna change unless we change the mind of the product that we're putting out there. So I think we also, as pediatric emergency room physicians, we need to also recognize what is the package that we need to do to each one of our learners to make sure that they're well prepared for that. I mean, they, even for our fellows, um, it changes a lot depending upon the environment that you're going and what you're doing. I was giving a, a little, you know, off cuff um, topic conversation to our fellows about procedures and asked Brad and Wendy that were there. None of the procedures were the fancy ones. We were talking about, you know, foreskin entrapment. We were talking about using the loop for abscess. We we're doing a dark foreign bodies fish sure. because when I went to the rural area. You know, those are the ones that I needed. And I'll tell you what, in an academic center, I was not trained on those because they were taking care of community hospitals. So each one of us needs to start molding. And I think the residency changes may help a little bit if it's done in a positive way. But you have to still be able to recognize things and recognize sick, not sick, what needs to be worked up further? How do I do that? What needs to be referred? And um, I agree, it depends on where you are. So there are a lot of general pediatricians who go to delivery rooms and a lot of general pediatricians who come into the emergency room to admit their own patients. So if that's something that is in your wheelhouse and that's something you're going to do with your life, you need to make sure you get more training in that area as opposed to as if you're going to be, you know, in a, an urban area or if you're going to be at a major academic institution where you're not going to do those things. Yeah. Fantastic. Right. point. Wendy. I can tell you one thing. Um, and in, in, we're not releasing anything that is uh, confidential yet. But in that report that is coming in, either we change something of what we're doing, and there will be some recommendations in the report um, that are going to be very strong. Or in about seven to eight years, we are going to be in trouble with developmental infectious disease, nephrology, rheumatology, dermatology, and other areas in pediatrics. So, um, um, and in by the same token, our subspecialty also may be overpopulated in certain areas. Uh, and so the job markets may, may drift us to going to do other things, not because we don't want to do, we don't want to do what we want to do, it's because we want to work in specific geographic areas and it's going to be saturated, which is going to drive mm -hmm. us to do other things. Um, so well, no more. I think that's a, a perfect segue. Um, thank you all. And we'll con continue to move on. I, I should say before I start sharing slides that uh, my perspective is um, a, a associate program director, very large residency program. We have 203 residents, um, which is is quite a bit. And they're all wonderful. Um, and, you know, ultimately, you know, I, I think the onus is on, you know, both the, the program and the program director, you know, to sort of, you know, set the stage. And you guys can see my, uh, probably see like all my slides, right? All right, let me just do it this way then. Um, all right, so again, these are proposed changes, right? So they are not official yet. Um, the final version is going to come out in September. And so programs will have from September until July to make changes to their residency programs. Um, and some of that is even more granular in terms of, of structure than, than you might think. Um, and so ultimately, it's going to be up to um, the individual programs 
um, to come up with the solution that works for them. Um, and so the big strokes of these changes that are proposed include an equal balance between inpatient, outpatient, and individualized experiences, um, recognize the importance of general pediatrics and subspecialty, that seems like a, a platitude almost, um, maintaining continuity clinic. Uh, many of you will say, my residency was like six months of NICU and then continuity clinic. Um, introducing subspecialty experiences as outpatient experiences early in training, the first 18 months, a mandatory mental health experience, um, and PGY-1 residents may be supervised indirectly with direct supervision immediately available. And I know that you know many of us practice in a lot of different ways, but now they're specifying that you don't have to like stand next to a PGY-1. Um, overall, they're saying three months of ED, which may be less than you currently have, one additional month of ambulatory gen peds, one additional month of inpatient, one less month of ICU, and under that ICU umbrella, PICU and NICU, uh, one less month of supervisory or classic senior resident time in the inpatient setting, and then the one that I think raised the you know the most ire in our field um, was procedures as necessary for future practice. So I'll discuss that in a little bit of detail, and then we'll go into some concrete examples with um, Ellie and David in, in a little bit. Um, so one of the, the biggest changes that we actually talked about at APPD is that requirements are now specified as weeks instead of educational units. And so perhaps serendipitously, our institution went from a 12 block calendar of irregularly scheduled months. So like one month was 31, one month was 28, one month was 35 to 13 sets of four weeks. And so programs, if they have a 12 block schedule, this may make it very difficult for them to, to count hours. And so the ACGME is specifying in terms of weeks spent on individual um, experiences as opposed to what was called an educational unit, which classically was um, for a half month, eight days, or a whole month, 16 days. Um, so what counts as a rotation now? You can see the proposed on the left in green and the current on the right. Um, four weeks or eight half days, right? Four weeks or eight half days for ambulatory and inpatient um, or supervisory. A longitudinal clinic needs to have 36 half days throughout the training. So that's your continuity clinic um, per year. Um, and they want that to, you know, occur in a way that doesn't cluster it all together. So it has to be spread out throughout the year. And a lot of programs do that X plus Y scheduling where they take residents and put them on, you know, a very particular block of outpatient and inpatient. And all they do is clinic for a while. And so it's a little bit of artificial limitation to that. So you can't just get all of your clinic right away. You have to spread it out through the year a little bit. Um, inpatient, um, they're keeping the same number of inpatient, but the makeup is different. They're really specifying that they want four months of general inpatient um, and two months of general inpatient versus subspecialty. And so a lot of hospitals will have a mix. They'll have hospital medicine and GI on a service together. Our institution has a GI team. We have a hemonc team. We have a pulmonary team. We have a complex care team. We have an endocrine and pulmonary or endocrine and nephro team together. Um, and so all of these individual teams is not really going to fit into that bucket of six experiences. And so I think depending on how the hospital structures things, they'll have to consider that. Um, another one of the big changes, three months of ICU, and that includes NICU and PICU, is the minimum. And so when we talk to some of our peer programs that um, don't even have a PICU in their institution, that was this is great for them because they'd have to send their residents off-site, often at a distance and expense to the residents to train in the PICU. Currently in our program, we have three months of NICU, one a year for residents, and two months in the PICU in the second and third years. Um, and so we've already gone to our neonatologist and you know, said that there will be a uh, likely curtailing of the amount of time. Um, and fortunately, the newborn experience remains intact. So you can see um, fat, pink, happy babies. Um, and then ambulatory changes. Um, this is where the greatest increases come into play. So now they're proposing 10 four-week periods of ambulatory as opposed to the previously mandated seven. It still includes a month of adolescent developmental pediatrics, a new dedicated four-week mental health training that could be contiguous or split up throughout the year, um, a mandated month of community advocacy, and three months of PEM. Two months have to be in an ED. One can be in an urgent care um, setting if you underline that. And back when I was a resident, I told myself I wouldn't say that. We had five months in the ED. 
Um, now our residents currently do four. And so if you look at these and think about your individual program, you can already start to intuit some of the the changes that that may have to to happen. Um, you know, when you look at, you know, individualized curriculum and other subspecialties, a lot of these proposed changes um, are curtailing some of those inpatient specialty services that our large hospitals have. And so there are some services that may have a lot of nurse practitioner coverage, other services that won't. Um, but I recall that when I was a resident, we were among the last group to be in the surgery service as rotating residents and on the you know neurosurgery teams. And when those ended, those services were you know sort of left with a situation where they had to you know find coverage and that these changes may be compressed over a nine month period is gonna be a challenge for programs. Um, this is directly from the ACGME proposed document. Um, and I'll share these slides with everybody afterwards um, via email and, and via link in the, um, the video notes. Um, but this will give you a little bit of a layout of what a year could look like in a 13 block schedule. Not everybody is getting vacation in the final month of the year, um, but it sort of lays things out. And you can see that um, there's a 40 weeks of individualized curriculum, right? And programs are gonna have to look at that and say, well, at least half of that needs to be elective and we can't make residents do all of this inpatient time. They may not wanna to come to the program or not may not meet the mandate. And so I think there's going to be a, a definite curtailing in some of the coverage for a lot of our inpatient services, you know, especially those hospitals that um, have very specialized services um, within their their walls. Um, this is a timeline, um, and it is the previous and current timeline via which they are, you know, working through through this. And this was uh, shared at the APBD meeting this spring. Um, the Committee is now reviewing the comments that came en masse, um, some from individuals, others as an aggregate from different groups like um, the AP section on emergency medicine. Um, and we are expecting sometime in September, hopefully in the beginning, the final requirement recommendations that will need to go into effect July 1st. Um, I don't think that we will get you know canceled as a program um, if everything isn't optimized I, I would anticipate and and those of you that are experienced in these matters could um, um, chime in and, and say that there'll probably be a grace period for programs to implement these um, but it will be a big sea change asking for a lot more outpatient time and perhaps a lot more structuring of the inpatient time um, the other part of this document that I think got a lot of folks in PEM and and critical care but especially PEM um, worried were that the ACGME eliminated that classic enumerated list of required procedures. So that that list was just, you know, struck out or redacted. So bag mass ventilation, endotracheal intubation, sutures. Um, and so when our residents read this, because it was a public document, one of our second year peds neuro trainees like, so I don't got to log anymore? And I'm like, not so fast. Um, number one, things haven't been implemented. Number two, um, when you look at some of their specific language, they did not eliminate procedures, nor they recommending eliminating procedures, but they are putting the onus on program leadership and residents themselves. Um, and so here's a couple direct quotes from the document itself. So yes, the ACGME agrees that the program must provide instruction and opportunities for residents to perform procedures as applicable to each resident's future career plans. All right. You have a residency with five residents per class, but not a big sim center. Well, how are you going to get them access to critical procedures versus if you are a large institution, how are you going to get your residents enough abscesses, you know, for instance? So I think you have to to have those procedures available, but, you know, think parsimoniously about, you know, when and where they are, they're doled out. Um, they want residents to perform all medical diagnostic and surgical procedures considered essential for the area of practice. So my mindset, and I'll share my proposed plan for our residency, is if you're in the ED, you are suturing, right? Um, I think opting out of a procedure just because you're going to go into gastroenterology when it is a common and necessary procedure for the patient that you have in front of you um, in that particular rotation um, probably is not in that patient in the, the resident's best interest, but there are many viewpoints in that area. Um, and certainly, you know, we would all agree, I think, that residents need to demonstrate why we do the procedures, what the complications are, and how to get a patient through that. Um, then they further iterated on their um, their future plans here and said, 
really the the program leadership needs to collaborate with a resident, look at their career plans, their aims, the needs of the community, and residents should do the procedures relevant to the patients they're taking care of and what they are planning on doing in the future. And then they list off this long list of procedures, some which were on the original list, um, some are new. And I know that our residents replace way more G-tubes than they do lumbar punctures, right? Wendy's smiling because she knows it happens in the ED, right? There's like four G-tubes for every LP that they get. Um, and so if somebody's going into, you know, complex care or general pediatrics affiliated with a the hospital, they're going to manage G-tubes. Way more often, they're going to do lumbar punctures. But previously, that procedure was not on that magical list that you had to log. And when you log six LPs, that meant you were good for your life. Um, and they made a, a key line item to say that the use of simulation to supplement clinical experiences encouraged. And that's why I've, I've invited uh, David to talk to you guys in a little bit. Um, so I don't think the, the sky is falling per se. So procedures are not canceled, um, to, to borrow the parlance of the, the current generation. Um, yes, that enumerated list of like, you need to do four abscesses, no matter where you do them in order to graduate. I, I think that. Um, needs a bit of a rethink, but procedures, in my view, in the view of many, are still a key part of training as a physician or a pediatrician. Um, so yes, our residents still need to do procedures that are relevant to their rotation and future career plans, right? If you are on the pulmonary complex care team, then you need to know how to manage and deal with a trach and change a trach. It happens on the rotation. That is our expectation. Um, defining that on an individual basis one of the other things that this new recommendation added was additional programmatic support. And so we've added two more assistant program directors just because of the dispersal work and the size of our, our program. Um, and so we have a program director, I'm an associate program director, and now four um, folks serving in the roles as assistant program directors to help the residents work through these curricular changes and their future career plans. Um, you know, in logging these procedures, no matter what system you use, um, has it been about compliance with recommendations rather than building competency? I think many residents have viewed it that way over the, the recent years, right? I got to get my number. And so I'm holding procedure sessions in a simulated fashion in May and June where they splint each other or they like work, walk through a nursemaids for me so that they can like get their numbers. But I really want to make sure that they know how to do a nursemaids at a barbecue or walk their cousin through it, you know, if they're going to be a nephrologist. Um, I've already had residents ask about opting out of logging, but then I've had third years who, you know, are going into a job and their job wants their list of procedures. I've had people that are going into another job, maybe a decade out, and they're like, hey, can we have your residency procedure list, right? Which is an interesting ask if somebody has it cataloged that. And so I think accounting for what you've done um, and making sure that you write those down and document those, I think is still important, even if it's just as a record for what you're going to be doing in your future career. Um, and I'd say that includes logging any procedures performed in an actual or simulated setting. Because I know almost none of my residents are going to do a central line. But if you're going into critical care and you've learned about it through simulation and you put your hands on an ultrasound probe, I do think that's helpful for a critical care program director to at least understand that their resident understands the basics and mechanisms of placing a central line, even if it was on a, a simulated patient. Um, I think we have to be more intentional about how closely we include procedures and the goals and objectives of each rotation. Really think about what opportunities are out there for residents to get. Um, and Javier, I will uh, join you in a in a moment there. Um, the rotation itself um, should have a list of procedures associated with it um, and include that as, as part of the full rotation experience. Um, and I think we can use the EMR like Slicer, Dicer, and Epic and, and make life a little bit easier to capture this data. Because I know a lot of residents are are logging things like seven months after they do it, and they're like, I don't know that I do an IV. I'm just, you know what? I'm just going to send it to Wendy. I hope she'll sign off on it. She, she, she did it with me, right? Yeah, I know. And then Wendy signs it and, and all is good. Um, but does that really mean that the resident's good at it? I don't know. Um, I say at minimum, and, and this is where I stand at, you know, the, my position in the program. I think every single resident that comes to our program should be able to do chest compressions, bag mass ventilation, apply an AED and control hemorrhage via direct pressure using a combat application tourniquet, like the kind that's included in Stop the Bleed. I think they all need to be able to do this. I don't care what they're doing. 
I, I want to make sure that they get experience in that. I know that um, most of these will be as part of simulation training, um, but when opportunities arrive and actual patients, get them a chance. Um, this is a draft version of required and optional procedures um, as I'm putting it into our goals and objectives. Um, again, it doesn't include everything, but it includes in the ED a lot more than what we had in the previous ACGME list, like G-tubes and cervical collar placement and clearance, those sorts of things. Um, and, you know, POCUS is a big part of our, our career. So if you're going into PEM, you should do a POCUS rotation. I, I firmly believe that. But I think it's also important, even if a resident's not going into it, to understand its application and use in our environment. And so I would expect them to both, you know, use this as sort of a, a field guide to the ED rotation, a scavenger hunt, or, you know, an opportunity to get exposed to them along the way. Um, at, at various points in our residency, we've also had like a critical care pathway or an acute care pathway. And it was designed for overarching rotation experiences for PEM and critical care and NICU. The changes in the curriculum are going to make us have to blow up this pathway structure. And so if you scan the QR code on the next page, this is a website I'm currently in, in the process of building, um, which is where, um, and I'll, I'll stop the share here in a moment so that I can pull up this website. This is how um, I'm structuring the emergency medicine pathway. And so Javier, while I pull that website up, I wanted to, to address uh, your question, sorry. No, it's not a question. It's a, it's a comment to mm -hmm. everyone. One of the things that um, has not lost, but because of ACGME changes and our students, residents, fellows, and reality, one of the things that has been clearly documented is sometimes some of these burnout and some of these things are the difference between what expectations are and what the reality is. So, mm -hmm. for example, um, we know for a fact that medical students have to do the check, 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 but then our residents get into the process of logging in. I think we're going to revamp completely our orientation because what they don't understand and we need, we need to train them to say is that when you document procedures, you document notes, you're learning what you're going to be doing when you finish. You have to follow CME. You have to do certain things that are related to that. So they structure their thinking that this is a requirement mm -hmm. Brad that asking me to do this. No, actually you're building up your job because as a DIO, I'm pretty sure that the WESH have to sign a bunch of, you know, uh, certification notes to say to the medical staff of another facility, you know, is this person capable or doing certain things? So we are also need to change a little bit the way we, we educate them about requirements versus what is needed versus what is the future that they're going to be experiencing. Mm -hmm. So they're not multitasking because the residency is asking them to do that. They're multitasking because the real life is going to ask them to do that. They're not documenting safety college mm -hmm. and all that because the residency is a pain in the body. It's because the next hospital that they work, they're going to be doing this. They're not doing the logs because of this, because they need to log the procedural sedations that they do. Otherwise, they're not going to be certified. Mm -hmm. So that transition needs to be brought into their into their thinking, and sometimes that reality is not expressed to them. So, as I said before, we're modifying the orientation this year, added one extra year, one extra day, and the program directors are like, "Why?" Because I think you know we noticed that over the last the last three to four years, that reality explanation was not there. Medical schools and even some residencies are not bringing them to this is what reality is all about. Mm -hmm. This is what you're going to be experiencing when you were doing this. So keep that in mind because, um, you know, the logging for them is Brad is asking me this. For the program director is I need to document this. For the DIO is Brad, give me that. Otherwise, I won't be able to certify. But for them is if I don't have this, I don't have a job in the future. Yeah. And I and well put, Javier. I think the the thing that maybe will help, but I'm maybe I'm looking just internally at our residents, but it, this may be broadly applicable is um, they need or deserve a little bit more structure so that they can think about, you know, what they need to get. And that's through their mentors. That's through the PD. Um, that's through, you know, official documentation. So um, this is absolutely a work in progress. And I'm happy to to work through this with any of you that want to, you know, design this for their program. But um, I'm, you know, looking at any field that you could go into um, recent graduates, fellows, attendings, people that are applying to it and say, hey, what do you need? And so for our residents, the essential electives that you have to have, you have to work on our Liberty ED, which is our community ED, and you got to do a block of urgent care. Um, 
And then there's other electives that you really should do, but you can pick and choose like ultrasound, simulation, anesthesiology. And then we have another list that they would all be great depending on your interest and time available, like a dedicated procedures elective, child abuse, toxicology, transport medicine, radiology, sports medicine, and we'll build out this list. Um, I'll have recommended and optional procedures. So if you are going into this field, this list should serve as your checklist of things to experience to learn about, to perform, to witness, to observe, to seek out experience in. You may not put a fingernail back on, but I think before you go into fellowship, you should at least see what that's like, right? Because that is a, a technically um, challenging procedure if you've never done it before. Um, we have other longitudinal experiences that exist outside of standard rotations. Uh, ben Carey will teach our residents how to use the store's video laryngoscope and how to serve as the second physician for our RSI quality improvement and in trauma bay checklist. Um, so they get like a, a cute little laryngostip, laryngoscope badge on their sticker, on their badge, so that they, they can be a um, the second physician or they can intubate a kid, you know, in the ED. But most residents don't want to do that. But we find that our processes are so detailed that they have to uh, get involved in that. Um, and then I'll include some information on scholarly activity, put some projects because most people that go into PEM uh, do benefit from doing that. And we're trying to build these out for each and um, every field that somebody could go into. Um, and I think ultimately, you know, it's going to, you know, benefit them and giving them a bit of structure, but it's still the onus is going to be on the on the resident. And I think a lot of the burden in getting this procedure training, especially for things that are less frequent or um, seen in more acute care settings, is going to be on our simulation experts. And so that is my very natural segue on over to David Kessler, who's going to be our, our next presenter. Um, he's the vice chair uh, of innovation and strategic initiatives. He's a professor of pediatrics. Um, he's the associate medical director of the SIM Center um, at Columbia University. He co-founded Inspire. He knows a ton about SIM and I think preparing for procedures that we see less often. Um, he was recommended by multiple of my colleagues as somebody who could really teach us a lot. Um, and so I welcome David to the stage. So is the challenge once you've gone to the full screen to find that mute button. Um, <laughs> that's a skill I need some practice in. Um, thank you, Brad. Um, it's really nice to be here. I feel like it's really come full circle. I believe the first competency-based simulation curriculum was presented um, as an abstract at one of the section of emergency medicine meetings, uh, you know, over 12 years ago. So um, what I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about how, how do we prepare uh, our trainees for procedures when there's a relative desert of clinical experiences. And I apologize for the creepy graphic, but I was playing around with Dolly and this is apparently what AI thinks when I put in, um, you know, doing an infant LP in a desert. So I don't know. It was at Phoenix Children's Hospital. I did not specify. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm going to be a little bit on a soapbox today when it comes to simulation. Um, medicine's really the last high stakes industry that does not routinely practice prior to performance of critical procedures. And, um, you know, here we have a picture of uh, our astronauts training in, in a pool. And so, as you know, um, so so much of that profession is just training and so little is just the space flight. And it, it feels like an inverse kind of ratio when it comes to healthcare. There's there's really a growing need for exposure. This has been an issue, but, but as Brad and others pointed out, um, our trainees have fewer chances to perform the required clinical procedures. Um, most graduate with an average of only three procedure, and that's just uh, from a log perspective, not from a competency perspective. Simulation, of course, is a really powerful tool for standardizing procedural training and also competency assessment, which is something we'll speak a little bit more about. Um, and finally, I, I really believe that including simulation-based training is an equity issue, uh, not just for trainees, but also for the, the, those future trainees' patients. So um, whereas, you know, part of me, like I like the flexibility of the new guidelines and that you could sort of tailor things, but it also then just leaves uh, a huge gap in terms of not creating some kind of minimum standard for how we train people and the, the skills in which they come out of residency with. So I, 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 like others had some initial gut reactions to like my favorite procedures that may have been cut <laughs> from the recommendations, but 
that's not what I'm talking about today. I really just want to talk about whatever procedure is chosen. I really feel like what we need is for the ACGME and others to be a little bit stronger in terms of figuring out what is the minimal uh, competency level we're looking for and get beyond the procedure log. So just a quick word about simulation. We all sort of uh, use simulation in different ways. Um, I see it as really an expanding set of immersive educational tools. So we're not just talking about the mannequin. Um, and it's more about the technique than the technology. So um, it may include mannequins, standardized patients, serious games, virtual reality, augmented reality, et cetera. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about a couple of this sort of techniques behind procedural skill training. These definitions come from the Society for Simulation uh, in Healthcare uh, Simulation Dictionary. And um, so just to get us on the same page with competency-based learning um, is an outcomes-based approach to medical education where we focus on the outcomes, emphasizing the abilities, de-emphasizing time-based training and promoting greater learner-centeredness. So the challenge of course being that we still have three-year residencies. So in some sense, some would argue you're never gonna get to competency-based learning because you do have a time-limited uh, nature to it. Uh, technical skills is any skill that's required for the accomplishment of a specific task, but, but, you know, those could be really simple procedures or those could be really complex procedures and they may include, you know, or many do include cognitive as well as the sort of kinesthetic components. So, um, the society, and I'll get to this in a second, just this year did a, did a research symposium. So they're in the process of, uh, undergoing a large literature review for many topics. Um, and trying to see sort of what the evidence is currently in simulation and, and where we need to go. So um, I, I'm one of the leaders in the group that's looking at mastery learning and deliberate practice, which is a specific uh, approach to skills training. And, you know, for quite some time, we've had evidence that technology enhanced simulation um, is consistently associated with larger uh, uh, effects for outcomes of knowledge, skills, and behaviors. Um, with moderate effects seen for patient-related outcomes, we don't have quite as many studies at that level. Um, and then there's there's only limited evidence to suggest that simulation-based mastery learning, which I'll talk about in a second, is a superior approach to non-mastery simulation instruction. Uh, it just takes significantly more time. So there there's a couple of gaps in that literature as well as we think about well, how do we apply that to our own procedural skill training? Um, I'm throwing in also proficiency-based medical education. So when you look at the surgical literature. Um, it's a similar sort of notion to the mastery um, where people need to achieve competency before moving on. Um, they tend to sort of move a lot faster with it and sort of integrate a lot of the robotics uh, uh, like lap sim mentor that sort of help move that forward. So there has been some evidence um, at the systematic review level for quite some time that simulation works. We published this framework and, and there's many on this call I see um, who are co-authors. Um, back in, I want to say 2010, 2011, where is, oh, 2015, okay. Um, which was really taking a, a previous model of procedural skills training that, training that was essentially the see one, do one, teach one model and expanding the model to sort of talk about how you would integrate simulation um, into skill development across different spectrum of learner experience. And, um, you know, loosely speaking, so here we see at the beginning when you're a novice, sort of start with a lot of simulation-based training and then as you start to integrate supervised clinical experience, which is our sort of speckled box, um, you know, as they're moving up the competency spectrum, and then, and then they could sort of graduate to some unsupervised clinical experiences, but as long as you're sort of integrating simulation-based training and assessment back in to sort of keep them growing toward being an expert. So basically, I think with all the evidence there is, and as, as maybe as we take away the list of required procedures, we could really start to think forward that, that no child should have a procedure performed on them that, they haven't, that somebody hasn't practiced first in a simulated environment. Maybe a bold statement, but, but as you talk to sort of friends and family that aren't in healthcare, uh, my experience has been that they're shocked this isn't the case. So of course, simulators and task trainers come in many different shapes and sizes. Um, as I said, it's not about the, the technology, but more the technique of how you, how you teach with them. Um, so, you know, as we think about, again, that simulation log mentality, um, I, I, you know, I feel similar, just, just going to log some procedures and simulation to me is the same as logging them clinically. And I don't really think that's enough. Um, and regardless of the modality. So again, this is, a, this is a game that we made for the iPad for a training on infant LP, which I think is now uh, 
you know, obsolete or taken off the store, that company got sold. Um, we have some uh, virtual reality sort of very up and coming. Um, th this headset below is just one that we did as part of uh, an army grant to, to try to measure cognitive load within the space. And I bring that up because I think that the promise of more adaptive learning and especially integrating the trainees individual stress into the evolution of a program to optimize learning is something that that we really will see realized within the next few years within the virtual reality environment. So that's one of the advantages there, though there are several disadvantages. Here, here's something we've been working on locally just for sort of training on just familiarity with these old defibrillators. So, um, you know, even even things like knowledge injection can be done um, in the virtual setting as one option for how to do this asynchronously. And of course, you have, you know, your fancy simulate uh, sim centers where you could sort of uh, measure and assess outcomes. So I'm just going to take um, us through a, a quick little journey of a single procedure and how I got my start sort of being interested in simulation and in procedural skills training. Um, and this is going back now, 2008, where um, one of my, I was a fellow at uh, Bellevue and one of my mentors said, hey, I just got this little plastic mannequin, which you see here on the right. Uh, can we do a study with this? Um, and I had a particular interest in infant LP as a procedure. And so we set out to do a, a study during my fellowship. And the goal is really to improve the training clinical success rates with infant lumbar puncture uh, via simulation-based training and assessment. So um, in doing reading sort of at the time, there was uh, Bill McGahey out at Northwestern was, was um, doing a lot of research in central line training using its mastery learning model. Um, it was initially proposed by Benjamin Bloom, and it, it's uh, a particular style of training that requires students to practice, study, meet predetermined criteria through periodic formative assessments uh, in the prerequisite domain prior to advancing. And there's, you know, depending who you were asked, there are seven core components or more to, to the mastery learning model. Um, if you're really doing it in this prescribed way. And so we, we, you know, convened experts, we made our own critical skills checklist, and we sat there training every intern one on one. Um, if they didn't meet one of the critical steps, they would sort of have an opportunity to, to practice and repeat on this little mannequin um, until they got through the whole checklist and achieved mastery. And at this single site study, um, that we did, we randomized people to either receive simulation early or sort of later in the year. And then we asked them just to do their procedural logs and tell us how they did on their first LP. And we were really surprised to find that those who did the simulation mastery were twice as successful as those who did not do it uh, initially. So very excited. We sort of went, presented this AEP, other places. We formed a network initially called Poise that eventually uh, merged with another one to become the Inspire Network which is a pediatric simulation network. Um, and in 2009, we sort of trained 200 pediatric trainees across 10 sites. Each year we would iterate around that, that year of uh, orientation. We would all have orientation programs and sort of like add a new thing you know, that year to see what else we could do to improve our outcomes. So we grew in 2010 to 24 hospitals, 500 trainees. This is the year we had our first site in France, 33 hospitals, 767 trainees. 2012, over 1,000 trainees at 44 hospitals. So this was over a third of the pediatric trainees at the time that were doing this. And this was largely unfunded, just a, a sort of consortium of educators like on this call who is sort of, we're all doing procedural training anyway. We might as well try one the same way and see if that works. And so every year we iterated and, and added new ideas. And eventually the final version was some uh, degree of the orange is our sort of cognitive pre-learning where we did some audiovisual training, let's get the knowledge stuff out of the way. They would come to orientation uh, for the most part. Some sites did it sort of uh, in a monthly orientation and they would do the mastery learning session. And then we realized that's not enough. So when they came to their ED uh, rotation or NICU rotation, we would give them a just-in-time refresher and assessment with this little rolling cart. Um, and you know, then, <laughs> and in the final year we added assessment. So we said, you know what? We have evidence from the prior years about who succeeds and not. We want you to say that someone's not ready versus ready to move on. And this was right around the time that we were talking about entrustable professional activities and sort of milestones and readiness. And so that, so, so we, there we were, we integrated all the theories we possibly could 
Um, and, you know, just to sort of take a snapshot of that, we have like sort of the pharmacokinetics of how do you learn procedural skills? So you have that initial mastery training up to sort of a, a, a minimal passing standard. And then over time, of course, your skills deteriorate. And right at the time of forgetting actually is the optimal time to do a just time refresher, though we couldn't always control that. Hopefully that was right around when you were coming back to the ED and, and we sort of bolus you back up to where you were. And then finally, um, you know, there's increased relevance learning at the point of care. And that's where we could do our sort of just in time assessment. So we, we shifted our focus again from better training to better assessment by the end. And that's because we had some data with just this four item scale that we had developed um, that if you were on the sort of right side with the green, you were, you were more likely to be successful the procedure. Notice more likely to be successful is still only 45 or 58% successful, which was not so great. Um, and that gave us a number needed to assess of, of six interns to prevent one failed LP. Um, Brad, I can't see the chat. So if there's anything coming up, just let me know. Happy to pause. And I also can't see people. So if anyone's raising their hands or something, let me know. So um, I'm not, obviously I'm not presenting all the studies along the way that we had, but, but I'll say that um, we did not have that glowing success of 94% and double the, the other ones. We had a lot of, of interesting findings, but largely it didn't work. Um, at the end of the day, um, people were letting interns do procedures regardless of if they were ready. And I think that's the culture that was, uh, you know, not ready to change at the time. Um, again, so people say, oh, I did this once and actually there became an overconfidence and, you know, by everyone around it. And maybe as we sort of tried to scale up and disseminate, um, we weren't really ensuring that, that people were achieving competency before going on. And this is just for one tiny little procedure. <laughs> So back to the uh, research symposium happening at the Society of Simulation in Healthcare, um, our group is asking, uh, you know, in doing a systematic review right now, they're completing what are the impacts of competency-based simulation procedural training on skill-based learning outcomes, not just infant lumbar puncture, but looking across the board. We know that it works for, for knowledge and attitudes and, and some behaviors, but um, very few studies done at this higher Kirkpatrick pyramid uh, hierarchy of evidence level of impact and behavior. Um, we reviewed, there's been over 100,000 studies uh, just at our broad screening. Um, and after, you know, reviewing the abstract stage, we were down to 46,000. So tons of literature at this point on proficiency and mastery learning and different strategies for improving skills. Uh, we, we've got it down to just 70 that we think really we're looking at the question. Um, and I'm not going to present those results today because that's ongoing, but just to say that there's a lot of literature out there, but not as much as you'd like in terms of showing what really works when it comes to simulation procedural training. Big team behind this, many people on this call. So, um, you know, my hope is in this, in this next sort of decade or so is that we really can look at simulation, not just as the quick tool, but as a technique and start to study what are the best educational techniques using any of our high technology approaches and immersive approaches to translate the, the training into improved clinical outcomes. This is another creepy doll. You, you look at this too long, it's super creepy. I mean, just take a look at the glasses. Uh, I'm not sure what the artificial intelligence was doing here. Of course, part of me does wonder, um, will our trainees even need to learn procedures anymore as, as our sort of robot overlords take over? Here is a, a robotic uh, fast exam being performed. And, um, you know, just to come back to Inspire, so um, this is an international pediatric simulation research network. It's now uh, at over 500 sites in 46 countries. It's a global community over a thousand members, it's free to join. Um, it's a research group, um, but educators who are just interested in being part of research are, are very welcome. And um, it's, it's officially a nonprofit now, which has had uh, several hundred thousand dollars in funding uh, every couple of years to be able to support a uh, research project, not just on skills, but anything involving simulation. So I encourage you to look this up. <clears throat> so the conclusion of this segment, I will say, um, Simulation is a lot of work, especially if you do something like mastery learning for skills training. And I think it, it, we really need to sort of ask, is this feasible and efficient or not? 
Um, and what other techniques do we need to study to, to incorporate all the procedural skill knowledge that um, trainees need during the three years? So I don't always use simulation, but if I do, I'm going to use mastery learning, deliberate practice or distributed practice model with just in time uh, boluses and assessments so that we could stay evidence based. And I guess we'll move on to any questions. Yeah, I definitely want the most interesting man in the world to teach me just in time training. Um, <laughs> allow me to, to welcome actually Ellie uh, concert to give a perspective on just coming out and training and going through a lot of these just in time. And then we'll hold a, a closing discussion with, uh, with Ellie and David. So I'm going to bring Ellie to the podium. Ellie, you should be able to, to share whatever you'd like to share uh, digitally. Um, she's currently a, a, a pediatric emergency medicine physician at Mer a Mercy One in Des Moines, Iowa, and is a recent graduate from uh, UCLA. And so Ellie was recommended to talk to the group about her experiences and really learning, hey, what do I truly need to be able to do to start independent practice? Did I did I have enough procedure training? You know, what was the role in some of my, you know, just-in-time training or all the, the programs that yeah, I'm yet available in a big program? So um, Ellie, thank you for joining us all. Of course. Thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, I think being out in the real world, you know, at first I did really wish that I had more procedural experience in uh, residency. I think it's tough. I trained at UCLA, so there are, you know, a million fellowships and fel fellows in every subspecialty that are kind of competing with you to get their procedural training. Um, which sometimes can kind of take away your ability to get that experience. Um, but I know I, I practice in Iowa and um, there is a, a couple of pediatric ERs here, but there are a ton of just community hospitals that are run by the pediatrics departments are run by a pediatrician who rounds on the floor, goes down to the ER and sees consults goes to the NICU deliveries and helps resuscitate the babies, rounds on newborn nursery, works in clinic. Um, so I think especially for them, people going into that, having enough procedural experience and comfort with taking care of sick patients, um, knowing what to do, knowing when it's time to kind of ship that patient out to a hospital with higher capabilities is important. Um, so I think that you know, hearing the kind of full spiel of the changes that are being proposed for the residents, um, residency requirements, I have mixed feelings because I think in some ways having it more tailored is kind of nice, especially for people who want to do outpatient peds or pediatric GI, it's that having more of an opportunity to explore their area of interest and get better at that um, is important, but I also think that sometimes people don't know what they want or what they like until they really actually try it and do it and spend time there. And I think that, um, you know, a general pediatrician should be able to do things like simple sutures, um, like a na nail removal, IND, a nurse made elbow splinting, even EKG interpretation. I feel like there were a lot of people in residency that by the end still didn't really feel comfortable reading an EKG. And, you know, those kinds of things aren't necessarily like, oh, they, you know, need to know how to do an intubation or whatever. But if you're going to practice global health or even do urgent care, um, or you, you're a general pediatrician, you have a super sick patient walk in, you know, you have to be able to at least stabilize them for a few minutes until the ambulance gets there. So I think just completely, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater and saying like, oh, we don't need to do these rotations to get all these experiences um, is not necessarily the best idea, but I do think it's nice if people, you know, can kind of tailor their desires if they're, if they're program is capable of doing that, you know, if they have those opportunities available. But I also think it's like maybe someone thinks they want to do gen peds outpatient and they do that for, you know, five years. And then they say, actually, I want to go be a hospitalist in rural Iowa. Like, you know, but I didn't do a single procedure in all residency. Like that's not good either. So I think some sort of middle ground where people can have that tailored experience, but there are minimum um, requirements of like, all right, you should feel comfortable removing a nail. You should feel comfortable applying a sp splint, you know, doing an IND. I think ba bag valve mask is super important anywhere you go. Um, and I AED, 
BLS, stuff like that. But um, I guess the other thought I had too was that, you know, in a lot of places in Iowa, a lot of the small towns don't have a pediatric hospital medicine fellowship trained person or a pediatric ER trained person. So kind of equipping those people with the skills to go out and be successful is important in residency. Um, so that people aren't just forced into like, oh, you definitely have to do a, you know, hospitalist fellowship to go work in a hospital when there's maybe there's only four peds patients on the floor, you know, and if they're really sick, they'll go to University of Iowa, but you should at least kind of know how to take care of those patients um, in the meantime, so. Javier, you have your hand raised. Yeah, actually, it's it's it's, it's um, actually backing what um, Dr. Conser uh, was saying mm -hmm. right now. Um, so since you asked me to talk about ACGME at the beginning, and we give a historical perspective, and then you have the list, right? So here here goes the typical process. We got a list that was insane at the beginning historically. That was mathematically impossible to meet. As a matter of fact, there were people out there in the field. In particular, since Dr. Kessel were talking about simulation, where simulation didn't exist. The only simulation that you had was suturing pig feet and chicken bone for the IO at that time. Okay. So the ACGME reviews that, reviews the comments and say, you know what? This list is insane. Uh, yeah, let's yeah. just remove some of that. Okay. And they remove some of the things. Then what happens? We go into the competency age right, and into the individualized training. So what the ACGM is saying now is not don't do the procedures. The ACGM is saying these are the minimal things that you should be able to train and competency prove your trainees. So what happened is we go immediately to say they're eliminating that, which is the same thing that they say for developmentalists, right? They say that you don't necessarily need to be board certified because they're asking, for example, um, for mental health is a mandate now. Well, two thirds of the country in pro training programs may not have pediatric psychiatry. So how can they mandate something that they're not gonna be anybody that will be able to teach it? What they say is that you need to figure out as a program, how you gonna come up with that experience. So I don't think, uh, the problem is we tend to go to the extreme to say, oh, they're eliminating. No, what they're saying is you don't need to track them, but we're asking you to be competent. And we also, we want you to make sure that I tailor to their needs. So the program can say, we're going to do it this way because the minimal standards, I'm pretty sure every program is going to be way above the minimum standards. So <laughs> it's how we looked at it. Every, every single time the ACGME comes with something, we say, oh, they're taking it out. They're not taking it out. They're giving options. You decide as the program where you want to go with that option. Your program is going to say, every trainee of mine is going to put a chest tube before the end. If you can do that, go for it. You know what I mean? They're ACME is saying, you don't need to do that. What they're saying is, we're not going to judge you if your trainees do not have a chest tube done. Do uh, you, you see what's the difference between yeah. the, yeah. Language, yeah. the language? So I think it's, it's not bad. And every program has the opportunity to go around it as much as they want. Um, and all what they're doing is removing that mandate that was not tailored to the trainee and that was not tailored to the reality. But you as a program director, as a program fellowship director, whatever, you can still decide what you're going to do and how you're going to train your guys. Yeah. David Shruti has a, a question in the chat about, I mean, there's a lot of task trainers. Like I've, I've practiced on like four or five different LP babies. Some have limbs and some don't have limbs. Um, you know, what, what is your, what is your thought on all the different task trainers? Does it matter which one you use or is it all about the process and the teacher? As it, I mean, it's a great question, especially as we look at different procedures. I mean, I think we don't have enough evidence for each procedure. Uh, of course, like as you approach like real authentic models where the fidelity of uh, the reality of it approximates a human, there will be benefit to practicing on that. There aren't many that are like that. And so in lieu of that, I look of, at sort of like cost effectiveness. And again, it's not at this stage, it's not the mannequin, but what are the sort of educational uh, underpinnings of the training itself? Uh, whether you're using the sort of hard plastic one I started with, or, you know, folks have now 3D printed their own, um, you know, spines and overlaid it with, you know, uh, ballistic gel. And everyone's got like, there's just so many of them. And then there's like a $5,000 one from, from one company. Um, 
there are going to be augmented reality versions where you could now layer on like full cinematic, you know, parent crying and screaming in the corner and babies, like all this stuff, the fidelity of the situation will, will be there. But how do we then march someone through all those stages of experience layering on the simple to sort of the more cognitive, uh, you know, challenging tasks like the screaming parent and the stress and the difficult LP. Um, that's where this is not new stuff, right? So procedural training, like just look at how people, how professionals train in their golf swing or um, the cameras we've had on football games and professionals for years that the technology exists, we just haven't brought it into healthcare. And I think that there's like an elephant in the room, which is that we still use trainees as a workforce in this country. And that if you asked any one of them, they would much rather be in a sim lab for a day than, you know, rounding and writing notes on the floor yet again, how much learning did they extract from that day, you know, versus what they might get. So I want to push back on the idea that there's too many procedures for them to learn or too much, you know, uh, for, for, I think the whole thing at some point needs to be blown up. If we really are being uh, honest about wanting people to achieve competency and skills or in sort of communication and the other, and the other, um, you know, co competencies that we're looking at. David, well said. And I think that segues into the next question that's proposed to Ellie, you know, does, what does procedural competency mean to you now versus what is it, what did it mean when you're a resident getting your evaluations or logging or, or doing those things? Has, you know, did your mindset change overnight or was it, or is it gradual? Uh, I think it, it did kind of change overnight. I think when it's you in the hot seat and there's no one supervising you, it's like you could have done an LP a hundred times, but you're, you know, on YouTube watching the video to make sure you know exactly where your, you know, target spot is and everything like that. And I think in residency, there's just some um, comfort in knowing, so knowing that someone's kind of looking over your shoulder and, I also think that it is like in residency, you're just kind of trying to ch check things off a list, you know, like I need X amount of this, Y amount of that, let's get it done um, versus really being like, okay, if, when I, the patient's in front of me and it's all on me, like, do I really know how to do this and what the steps are? Um, so I think that, it, you know, in residency, maybe it's more of a quantitative thing. Like, oh, I've done seven suturings you know like in this block or whatever but when it's in front of you it's more like okay well should I do a double layer or a single layer or what would you know my mentor have said in this case so I think in real life co competency is more gray than black and white and in some you know I think a lot of times being newer out I ask some of the older more experienced attendings like what would you do for this even being done, you know? So I think the competency is kind of an ongoing thing too, that you can always become more com competent over the course of your career. Yeah. yeah, it's not an, it's not a, a either or, right? It's not one or the other. I mean, they, they, you still need to do a lot of pattern recognition. It's a lot of motor skill development, a lot of things. And unfortunately that comes with a little bit of practice. Um, I'm gonna go back to what Dave was saying in regards of we need to blow the whole thing up. In reality, yes, we need to blow certain things up uh, because right now in actually not only in the United States, I do a lot of global medicine in Europe, South America, Central America, and uh, Caribbean is all service driven. As a matter of fact, we are lucky in our country uh, here in the United States that after 1996, every single patient needs to be almost preceptive. You're gonna pay a penny because in the other countries, you don't do that. But blowing off, I'm going to give you an example of how sometimes we don't think about it. So we have all these global health rotations. I'm not saying everything needs to do global health rotation. I'm just giving you an example. So the intent of global health is because we're going to go there, we're going to lose some patients, but there's absolutely nothing wrong to design a global health rotation that is procedural skill driven if you're going to do, for example, pediatric emergency medicine. See what I mean? We're always welcoming fellows that come or residents come from above, but I can tell you, Dominican Republic, they had a brand new ED that we just finished remodeling. You probably do about 15 LPs a day. You probably intubate six people a day. <laughs> and you're going to probably center lines because they step down ICU is down there. So you, we also need to start saying, okay, so for certain individuals, what do we need to do? That? And they that they do have the simulation because what they do is they, they do not let anybody do these things unless at least in a visual simulated environment, you know, like Ellie was saying, 
what are the steps that you're going to do and if something fails how are you going to go around it you see what i mean so we need to really think beyond but the keys the keys look what she or what dr concert had been saying hearing it excuse you say iowa all the time yeah. right yeah. okay so here is we do this but if you don't have these we're going there I think like Dave was saying, the day that we blow it off and say, okay, tell me where you're going, tell me what you're doing, tell me what you need, and then we'll figure that out. Many years ago, we were allowed to do rotations. I used to do it, but people don't use it as much. That if you go to a private practice, if you sign a contract in a private practice on South Dakota, the program will allow you to go to South Dakota for about a month as an elective. So you can learn everything else. And then you come back and you have to do an individual learning plan to say, I just went there. This is what I'm going to need. Please help me to do that as part of my six month of individual learning. More of that is what we need because mm -hmm. that way we can cater everybody to move forward into the direction they need to go. Yeah. Yeah, I think but I think what both both of what you guys just said speaks to a little bit is how do we increase learner engagement? Uh, and part of that's relevancy. And but the other is this the consequence and the stakes. And so I think somewhere between like the quote unquote old days where we had no supervision. And so the stakes, the, the stakes were just pushed up, right? So what, what Dr. Concert is talking about now, like you would feel in residency. And I think that's why there was maybe more of a drive for that, for that learning at that time. But I think, I think again, simulation fidelity is not just the mannequin, but you could think about the psychological fidelity and we need to do that a bit more too, to get um, whatever experiences they're having you know, whether it's high, more higher stakes assessment or just increasing the psychological, you know, uh, arousal of the situation to make sure that that learning sticks a little bit better. Um, I do think that it's always been a challenge. Uh, you know, the global, I did a global health residency track and, um, you know, it's always a challenge thinking of it like as that is our place to go do procedures, though you're absolutely right, Javier, because it's sort of, if, you know, again, as we move towards sort of like the equity, equitable care, not just in the US, but sort of across across the world, like you would hope, as you said, that sort of folks are still doing a, some kind of minimum competency before they start doing those procedures. And then, yes, it would sort of be probably advantageous to wherever they're visiting. Thank you, everybody. And out of respect for time, I think we'll close the session down. I think what I've, what I've learned and reflected on is that, you know, it's not purely the resident's role. It's not purely the program's role. I mean, you have to collaborate in this. We probably have to rethink a whole lot of it. And, you know, initially when, yeah, when I read that document, I had negative thoughts and feelings, but it's an opportunity. I mean, as with any of these, it is an opportunity to, to rethink what we do. And for those of you that have access to simulation centers, tap into the resources. Um, for those of you with not, call folks like David at Inspire or partner, you know, with them. Um, and, you know, if you've got faculty that have trained at your institution that have gone out into practice, you know, like Ellie, gosh, ask them, what, you know, what have you learned? What do you really need? And if you've got a year left in training, fit those skills into that, right? That's a lot of time and a lot of elective time to work on those things. Um, and I, I think it is an opportunity for those of us in education. So thank you, everybody.